I'm haunted by the stories of two women. The first is Andrea. Andrea was a stay-at-home mom of three small children when she was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 36. Fortunately, her husband had good health insurance, so she was able to get the preventive care she needed, including a mastectomy. But when symptoms persisted, genetic testing revealed she carried the gene for breast and ovarian cancer, despite no family history of cancer, a 1 in 800 chance. She was then able to get additional protective surgery, including the removal of her breasts and reproductive organs. The second is Verda. Verda was a single mom of two children when she felt a lump in her breast at age 38. A state-sponsored screening program revealed it to be cancerous, and her state-funded health insurance paid for its removal. But shortly thereafter, she lost that insurance. Several years later, while working as a waitress with no health insurance, she felt a pain in her chest. Despite her history, she decided not to go to the oncologist because she was afraid she couldn't pay his bill. By the time she went to the ER with dizziness, the cancer metastasized throughout her body. The first woman, Andrea, is my beautiful wife. Today, she's healthy and cancer-free. The second woman, Verda Wells of Springfield, Illinois, died on July 2, 2009, shortly after that ER visit. Both women got the same diagnosis at roughly the same time, and both lived in the richest nation on Earth. But they also lived in the only wealthy country that doesn't guarantee health insurance for all. The result is enormous disparities in financial protection and health outcomes, as illustrated by my wife's story and that of Verda. This isn't just about stories, but also hard facts. A white baby born in America today has the same chance of seeing their first birthday as one born in Europe, while a black baby has a lower chance than one born in Libya. The Roland Park neighborhood of Baltimore has a life expectancy of 84 years, higher than the national average, while three miles away, the Sandtown neighborhood has a life expectancy of 67, lower than that of North Korea. Before the Affordable Care Act came along, 80% of Americans had quality health insurance, like my wife and I, through their employer or through government programs like Medicare and Medicaid. For some, this insurance was far from ideal, as it featured high costs and a limited choice of providers. But overall, this was substantive coverage, which enrollees were by and large satisfied. On the other hand, the other 20% of Americans were either uninsured or faced the prospect of buying insurance in the unstable and discriminatory non-group insurance market. This is a market where it was totally legal for insurers to discriminate against the sick for any reason. Insurers could deny the sick coverage, they could charge them much more than the healthy for insurance, or they could exclude their pre-existing illnesses from coverage. As a result, if you were healthy, you could get health insurance. But if you were sick, like Verda, you were out of luck. This defeats the whole notion of health insurance. Health insurance is supposed to protect you against financial risk, not protect your insurance company against the sick. And as a result, people in this market we're just one bad gene or one bad traffic accident away from bankruptcy. Now, if you're part of the Fortune 80% like my wife and I, why should you care? I would argue you should care for three reasons. The first is risk. Unless you have a tenured job with lifetime employment, you are always at risk of losing your employer-sponsored insurance. Indeed, in the decade before the Affordable Care Act passed, 10 million Americans lost their employer-sponsored insurance. That's 10 million people who thought they were financially secure, only to face the risk of devastating medical spending. The second is cost. The uninsured actually impose a high cost on the insured. Under US law, hospitals must treat anyone who comes to the emergency room, regardless of insurance status. When the uninsured are unable to pay their bills, this becomes uncompensated care a $50 billion a year cost that's passed on to the insured in the form of higher bills. The third is economic efficiency. The very lack of universal coverage lowers the efficiency of the US economy. 
Individuals with health insurance on their job are afraid to leave those jobs for fear of losing that insurance. And economic research has shown that many individuals are unwilling to move on to productive new jobs or to start new businesses because of these fears. Given that mobility is the lifeblood of the US labor force, this hurts all of us by shrinking the size of our economy. Now, Americans have had a long-standing interest in fixing our broken insurance markets. But here we run into a problem. You can't just legislate the removal of insurer discrimination in a vacuum. Indeed, seven states tried in the 1990s, banning the ability of insurers to discriminate in their non-group insurance markets. And in all seven states, the same thing happened. Insurers were worried that if they couldn't discriminate against the sick, they'd be swamped by sick enrollees and lose money. So insurers either fled the market or raised prices through the roof, cratering the non-group insurance market in all seven states. One of these states was my home state of Massachusetts, and our non-group insurance market was a disaster. Then our governor and future Republican presidential nominee, Mitt Romney, had an interesting idea. Romney thought it was unfair that the insured could avoid buying insurance and yet get health care for free when they were sick at the emergency room. Romney's idea was to mandate that everyone buy insurance so that the healthy pay their fair share and so the insurers don't get, get, just get stuck with sick enrollees. And to make that mandate affordable, Romney proposed subsidies to offset the cost of health insurance for low-income individuals. Governor Romney asked me, to use economic modeling to assess whether such a plan was viable and affordable for the state. I found that it was, and I'm proud to say this played a key role in the passage of our state's health care reform in the spring of 2006. Romney's three-legged stool, banning insurer discrimination, an individual mandate, and generous insurance subsidies, became the basis for Massachusetts' first in the nation universal health insurance coverage law. The uninsurance rate in Massachusetts fell to 3% compared to 18% nationwide. And premiums in our non-group insurance market fell by 50% relative to the rest of the country. <coughs> Meanwhile, there were no negative effects on the vast majority of state residents that already had quality health insurance. Indeed, this law was so successful it became the basis four years later for the Federal Affordable Care Act. Once again, President Obama and the US Congress asked me to use economic modeling to assess whether the Massachusetts three-legged stool model could work for the nation as a whole. The first leg was a ban for the first time in our nation's history on the ability of insurers to discriminate. No longer can insurers deny coverage to the sick, charge women more than men for health insurance, or exclude asthmatics or cancer survivors from coverage. The second was an individual mandate, albeit with exemptions for low-income individuals and those for insurance is too expensive. The third was a two-pronged approach to health insurance affordability, an expansion of the low-income Medicaid program for our poorest citizens, and the introduction of generous tax credits to offset the cost of health insurance in the new state ACA exchanges for the, low, for the lower middle class. I found that such a plan could work for the country, and work it did. Within two years of implementation in 2014, 20 million Americans had gained health insurance coverage. Economic research has shown that because of the ECA, the uninsured faced reduced financial distress, were more likely to have a regular source of care, and got more of the preventive care they needed. Indeed, recent studies have found that tens of thousands of lives were saved by the ACA. Meanwhile, premiums on the new state exchanges were below projections, leading the cost of the law to be well under budget. And predictions of negative effects proved unfounded. As employment growth in the US continued unabated, and employer-sponsored insurance premiums grew at their slowest rate in measured history. But while the ACA was a policy success, it was a near-term political failure. Partly this reflects the fact the law wasn't implemented until 2014, four years after its passage. This gave opponents four years to vilify the law in theory, 
while supporters had no tangible benefits to point to in practice. Then, when implementation of the law was hounded by technical failures, it strengthened the narrative that the law wasn't working, even though those failures were fixed within a few months. The ACA was an early success, delivering coverage to millions at below budgetary cost. But these successes could not break through the noise. And the supporters of the ACA suffered enormous political losses. By 2017, we had a new president and a new congressional majority who had campaigned on repealing the ACA. And things looked dire for the law. But then a funny thing happened. The law had been in place for a few years, and folks started to appreciate its benefit. Many individuals had benefited from the ACA, and they didn't want to see those benefits go away. Meanwhile, opponents could not deliver on an alternative that did not result in tens of millions of Americans losing insurance coverage and the reintroduction of pernicious insurance market discrimination. As a result, by 2017, public support for the ACA crossed 50% for the first time, and the efforts at repeal failed. So where does the ACA stand today? It's still the law of the land, and it's largely working as intended. But the battle over repeal weakened the law, in particular through the removal of the individual mandate and the erosion of insurance market protections. As a result, two to three million Americans have lost health insurance coverage. And premiums on the state exchanges have risen rapidly because we no longer ensure the participation by the healthiest individuals. Fortunately, there are changes we can make to strengthen the ACA. Some are relatively modest. While the ACA features tax credits to offset the cost of health insurance for low-income families, too many Americans continue to find health insurance unaffordable. An expansion of those tax credits could make health insurance attainable for low-income families struggling to make ends meet. Some problems are more fundamental. Perhaps the biggest failure of implementation of the Affordable Care Act was the rejection by some states of the Medicaid expansions. Medicaid is a state-run program, but under the ACA, the federal government agreed to pay 90 to 100 percent of the costs of covering all the poor, an incredibly good deal for states. Yet due to political opposition, a number of states turned this down. This means women like Verda could have had life-saving health insurance at virtually no cost to the state. But politics got in the way. Another problem is a lack of competition on the state ACA exchanges. In many areas, these exchanges feature only one or two insurers, resulting in very high premiums. One approach to addressing these issues is the public option. The idea here is quite simple. Let's make private insurers compete with a new government-run plan, like expanded Medicare. Low-income citizens in states that didn't expand Medicaid could then enroll in this new plan, bringing millions into coverage. And it would provide robust competition for private insurers on the exchanges bringing down premiums. But even this approach faces some limitations. Millions of Americans like Verda will continue to fall through the insurance cracks because of issues of life transitions or affordability. And more broadly, our fragmented multi-payer private health insurance system features high and wasteful administrative spending. An approach to address these shortcomings would be to move to a single-payer health care system, where all private health insurance is replaced with a single, free, government-run plan. Americans will be enrolled in this plan from birth, ensuring truly universal protection against health risks. And health care costs in the U.S. would fall as we got rid of the administrative waste associated with our multi-payer health insurance system. Sounds good, but it runs into three political hurdles. First, while those who buy insurance would no longer have to pay for it, the government would have to pay instead in the form of higher taxes. This is a simple trade in theory, but in practice it feels like a politically traumatic tax increase. Second, the 160 million Americans who are by and large satisfied with their employer-sponsored insurance would likely revolt against being forced into a single government system. And third, and perhaps most important, this would mean wiping out a nearly $1 trillion private health insurance industry. 
this industry will not go quietly into the night. As a result, single payer is not a near-term political possibility. So where does this leave us? I like to think of healthcare reform like bowling. Our goal is to knock down all the pins that block us from universal health insurance. But we have to be careful not to throw the ball too far to either side, in which case we can end up in the gutter of millions of newly uninsured facing discriminatory insurance coverage, or the gutter of political impossibility leading to inaction. Fortunately, there's plenty of room down the lane for creative approaches like a public option or expanded tax credits. We just have to keep throwing the ball between the gutters till we knock down all those pins. I used to start all my healthcare speeches with a joke that's well known among the health policy wonks. The health economist dies and goes to heaven, and when she gets there, she's told she can ask God one question. So she asks, will we ever see universal health insurance coverage in America? To which God replies, yes, but not in my lifetime. <laughs> I'm proud to say I don't use that joke in my speeches anymore because we have shown the willingness to take the difficult steps necessary to fundamentally expand health insurance in America. And Americans want to move forward to build on the ACA, not backwards to the bad old days of discriminatory insurance. I don't know how we're going to get to universal health insurance coverage in America, but I know we will eventually. Because it makes economic sense, it makes political sense, and it's the right thing to do. Thank you.